Good afternoon, and welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association, uh, sponsored in part by MIT Professional Education. I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I will serve as moderator today. Alumni who wish to ask a question of our guest today, f please fill out the form on your screen under the webcast. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. I'm joined today by Institute Professor Emilio Bizzi, investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research and professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. In his lab, Professor Bizzi and his team explore the building blocks of action. Each time you stand up, hug a friend, or drive a car, dozens of the 600 muscles in your body work in concert to execute your brain's commands. Professor Bitsi explores how the brain activates these movements synergistically through circuits of neurons in the spinal cord. Better understanding of this process may lead us to better informed and less invasive treatments for neurological disorders like Parkinson's, MS, and traumatic brain injury. Professor Bitsi, welcome. Can you start us off by giving us a little overview of your current research? Well, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, as you said, um, my interest is uh, uh, how the brain controls movement. But uh, to describe my work, you, uh, you did it quite nicely in a very synthetic way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let me sort of place my work in the broader context. And the broader context is uh, uh, movement. Now, we do movements all the time. I'm agitating my hands. I want to get uh, this <laughs> bottle here. It is simply sim simple. Sim nobody thinks much about it. Uh, we have a foggiest idea what the brain is doing about it. But uh, um, there are, under this uh, very simple everyday actions, tremendous amount of computations. Why is that? Well, because in order, just, just in a very broad way, in order to move, you have to have a goal. And the goals are represented in the frontal part of the brain. The goals are ideas. And uh, the ideas, uh, obviously, uh, are within the ideas comes neural activity in, the, in the, the frontal lobe. And that can be seen with fMRI and this kind of things. But that activity gets into the most posterior part of the brain. And that is where the goal gets to be implemented. But the, the great complication and the great uh, importance uh, of uh, the process is that uh, a lot of sensor information is needed in order to produce this marvelous thing, which is a gesture, uh, like let's say uh, in solving, in getting to this bottle, I have to look at the bottle. So the visual information comes in. Uh, if uh, you were to say, or if you were to say something, my auditory system would be immediately make me try to turn toward you. So you can see that immediately there is a lot of, of sensory information from the environment that gets into the brain and very quickly is transformed into action. But in addition to that, there is a lot of information that comes from the body itself. There are lots of receptors on the skin. Try to, try to uh, when it's cold, try to use the hand. You will see that uh, because your fingers are anesthetized by the cold, it's, bit, it's difficult. Not impossible, but it's difficult. <laughs> uh, the same is uh, uh, our, uh, we ha the, in order to move, you have to know where you are. Because uh, obviously, if the motor program to do this is different from to do this. So obviously, if I am this way or that way, it does make a difference. And yet, it's done. And it's done with grace. It's done with, uh, uh, a lot of speed because it's done very quickly. So now the big problem is 
in the head we have millions and millions of cells and they talk to each other okay how do, how is it possible to do a very simple action that's that's a, it's a, it's a big problem and so big that very often i think why did i get messed up with investigating this <laughs> complicated problem okay so but uh, Obviously, uh, throughout my career, I've done many, thing, many different things uh, in, uh, to study the, the, the brain. I study reflexes, I study uh, the activity of uh, recording from various cells of the brain, and so forth and so on. But uh, really, in the, um, in the next, uh, in the last, in the past uh, 20 years or so, I focused on a great big problem, uh, which actually, surprisingly, was has been neglected in uh, uh, still is quite neglected but so the problem is uh, when I make a movement usually I activate all sorts of muscles because let's say turning to this bottle you can see I use my eye movements the neck movements and then I, the trunk so a couple of hundred mus muscles are activated but the muscles, of course, are controlled by nerve fibers. And the nerve fibers don't just s control the muscle, but they control all the muscle fibers. So there are thousands of signals that go to the muscles. So the, if you consider all the muscles together that are activated when, uh, even when you do a simple things, you see that the space that the, ma that the central nervous system has to control is gigantic. So there is a, this redundant, enormous space. Okay, how these millions of cells handle this space? There must be somehow, given that we move very quickly in, in, in relationship to the world and so on, there must be a way that nature has found to simplify this process. And that is what I've studied. And it came out, actually, of a serendipitous... Uh, I was investigating with my colleagues the spinal cord, and we really wasn't very clear what we were doing, sort of exploration. So, so it, came, it came out that uh, uh, there are areas in the spinal cord that when they are activated, they activate the muscles, but they don't activate just all the muscles. They activate the muscles in groups. Okay, so these are little modules. Okay, and that's where it's uh, it started. So different nodes or different modules activate different groups of muscles, or can each node or module activate yeah. all of them depending e upon e the signal each, it gets? Each module module is a set of cells that that somehow through anatomical connections activates a set of muscles. I see. And then uh, let me show you on, uh, on, on what, uh, what, uh, what I mean by, so this is just my generic uh, introduction to uh, understanding how the brain controls. Well, this is what I mm -hmm. basically I said until mm -hmm. now. Okay, so these are, this is a representation of a muscle and uh, so you can see uh, the muscle um, or the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the arm, the biceps, and uh, but uh, a tiny part, the muscles is made up of muscle fibers, and you can see on the right side there, and the yellow uh, lines are the nerve, nerve fibers that distribute. So this gives you an idea of uh, the number of cells, uh, fibers that uh, need to be activated for each. Got it. Portion. Okay, so, and this is the, the main concept, and that is that somehow the central nervous system is organized to, uh, and this, oops, uh, sorry, uh, I have to go back. Okay, so th this is what, it, is there a pointer here? No. Okay, so you, so you can see where it says synergy, that those are a representation of a set of interneurons that are somehow anatomically, probably genetically specified to uh, 
activate a set of muscles indicated as A, B, and C. That is um, a synergy, and these synergies uh, are, um, can be uh, seen either by stimulating the brain, in particular the spinal cord, or if you don't want to do that, and you cannot do that when you recover <laughs> from uh, uh, humans and so on, you can record from the muscle activity and extract through algorithms that have been developed. Actually, one of the algorithms that we use was developed by Sebastian Sung that you have interviewed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> He's before, the man, Before right? he got involved <laughs> with uh, connectomics, mm. remember that? And uh, he, um, uh, as, a, as a computer scientist, developed an algorithm that allows us to extract these modules. It's kind of almost like re reverse engineering, going yeah, from yeah. the sensors to the yeah. to the brain. Yeah. So, so this is no, the the interesting, th and then I shut up. <laughs> the interesting thing is that uh, uh, these uh, with uh, you extract these modules, and you can ask the question: Well, in this particular uh, action of the of the arm or the leg, how many modules did you find? Well, the number of modules is really four, five, or six. It depends but not that many more, and consequently you have a complete, a great deal of simplification yes. considering the number of muscles versus the number of modules. Fascinating. Okay. The other thing is that the same module is used, is reused in different uh, uh, type of movements. Mm -hmm. So let's say if now I'm writing, I use a set of some of the synergies that are used when I do this. So that is, an, in other words, there is the property of compositionality. That means that somehow these little modules can be combined linearly in the, by, the, by the body in order to construct uh, different type of movements. And from this point of view, See, <coughs> then th the motor system is somewhat similar in principle to the genetic old language that are systems where you have, as it says here, a large number of meaningful entities that are quite distinct. They, in other words, you generate a universe of different things on the basis of combinations. Okay. And very now, much like language. Very much like language or the genetic code. Yeah. You know, different yeah. genes and so. So, um, so may, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll stop here. Okay. Think. Um, Let me see. What's, it'll what's probably next. take us a moment or two for the questions to come in, but um, perhaps I can ask you one or two of my own yeah. in, uh, in the beginning. Um, they told me to stop at the last. Uh, okay. This is something that uh, uh, I forgot to, to mention. Okay. You know, that I talked about the spinal cord, and you can see the spinal cord in the lower part of this figure. Then you see the brain. Uh, that green area is the motor cortex. It's one of the main centers where the sensor information and the goal information that comes from the front of them is combined in order to provide signals that go to the spinal cord and trigger these little modules. Now it looks like the green area and the gold area were talking to each other. Yes, they do, because the motor system is uh, obviously a great part of the brain is not for thinking, not, <laughs> not for talking, it is for moving. Yeah. And then there are many structures here indicated three or four, the spinal cord, the cerebellum, which is that yellow uh, mm -hmm. part, and the basal ganglia, which are the nuclei under the cortex, they are portrayed in uh, blue uh, or yes. azure, yes. and then the motor cortex. But there is much, but many more areas of the cortex are involved in movement, yeah. So um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how your work falls into the spectrum of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences or the work of the McGovern Institute. 
uh, for brain research and, and over the course of your career at MIT, how has the scope or breadth of either of those changed? Yeah, so um, um, <coughs> around uh, 1984, 85, something like that, uh, I, um, I became the first chairman of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Now, uh, before that, uh, MIT had a uh, psychology department, and then there was the Whitaker College that had a section on brain science. So, uh, under the leadership of that time, of uh, uh, the provost was Francis Lowe, and the uh, vice president for uh, research was Ken Smith. They asked me to uh, put together the two parts and uh, form. I think that ultimately when the department was formed, the uh, provost was John Deutsch. Uh, but I don't remember exactly. But in any case, uh, uh, maybe. But certainly it started, um, the original appointment uh, was made by Francis Lowe. And then, uh, and then you know, but Ken Smith oversaw the entire process. And uh, now, at that time, my major task was to bring in molecular biology, which is a very, obviously, a very powerful set of uh, uh, findings that uh, uh, are extremely important for uh, understanding the brain, understanding every living uh, creature, and so, this is what uh, uh, I, I did uh, because uh, the, in this agreement of putting together psychology and, um, and, uh, and Whitaker College uh, neurology, uh, neuroscience, uh, was there were a number of positions. The, mainly these positions went, uh, most of them, to establish uh, the um, molecular biology, neuro, the neurobiology. In other words, to understand the genetics, the, uh, the biophysics, and so on. And that is, uh, that w uh, line of thinking continued with McGovern. Because McGovern also uh, has made a number of appointments of people that uh, come from molecular biology and genetics. And uh, so it's, there is now a balance between uh, uh, people uh, that are interested in systems, visual system, motor system, and so on, uh, versus people that are interested in the basic um, machinery of the brain. Why it's so important? Well, because uh, nowadays uh, people use uh, techniques that come in from physics, from molecular biology, there is also all this ability to change the genes and getting transgenic animals, so that's very important. And so that uh, it, it's amazing how in the last few years, science, uh, neuroscience has acquired a large number of tools from uh, the outside. And uh, that uh, puts a lot of burden on neuroscientists because now you can use, now you have the tools, you have to use your imagination how to make the right uh, discoveries. It sounds to me like you're describing a lot of convergence of, of disciplines in yes, some ways. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. So a second question I have is, um, do you envision a day when hospitals will not treat any neurological disorders with invasive or even pharmaceutical interventions, but with advanced genetic or optogenetic treatments or therapy? No. Okay, I think in a word. I, I think it's a, it's a no, I, I, I think it, I, I cannot see that, frankly. Mm. Um, there, there will be, um, you know, op optogenetics is a technique to stimulate the brain with light. But um, it would be very difficult to apply that, at least now, <laughs> to, to the humans because you have to sort of open the skull, put some. So it's not feasible. Right. You can do it <laughs> in a mouse and so on. But, uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, the, the brain is, uh, is cells. Cells communicate partly with uh, electrical potentials, but also with neurotransmitters. They are chemicals. That is, and the manipulation of transmitters is what uh, is done in 
many, many psychiatric disorders and neurological disorders. Yeah. So I, I frankly don't see that, uh, you know, hands off, I'm afraid, I will not see it, but I don't think my even younger students would see it. <laughs> Okay, we have some, some questions here from our alumni now. Let me take some of those. Jeanette in Lake Forest, Illinois asks, you mentioned the, connection, the connectome research. Can you comment on the progress on or your hopes for the Human Connectome Project? Well, that's... <laughs> um, uh, I'm a, <coughs> you know, a, a great believer that uh, the, and this, the uh, anatomy, that is the architecture of uh, the brain, is uh, 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 fundamental importance in understanding the functions. For instance, in my case specific, you have to have uh, the cortex controls the spinal cord, but controls the spinal cord by sending uh, fibers uh, at, the, at the interneurons that, for instance, produce that module and not something else. So uh, the anatomy is very, very important because it's through the anatomy that uh, there is an emergence of uh, activity and thinking and everything else. Okay. So um, now, um, so uh, start uh, learning about the, the connections, but particularly, I think, learning the connection in with the function function in mind you know you want to you have a function you know that there are there is a connectivity that does something that uh, to implement that function well the connection has to be very close you know between the question and the the, uh, the, the anatomy that it often it's not done because so if you ask a generalized question, I it's think a not generalized be question useful. is not that useful because also it, it because okay so you connections you can see them uh, and describe them but you, you have the problem particularly when you go down to the electron microscope and see the synapse and so well you have to go back and where is this com fi fiber coming from and uh, and the brain. <laughs> Pick, pick a cell in the cortex, well, cell in the cortex will get inputs from the frontal lobe for a goal, from the visual cortex for the light, for the vision, for the auditory cortex, for the, for the proprioceptive system. So, so uh, how you do that is um, once you look at uh, just a few synapses and so on. So. I, I find it. Uh, a little bit, uh, I, I mean, I'm a, a touch skeptical about uh, uh, an approach that uh, um, uh, tries to describe everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but maybe I don't, uh, maybe I'm not too generous about that approach, but I'm a little bit skeptical, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, Eric in DC asks, are spinal modules used in current work with paralyzed patients? Um, well, there is, um, I think that uh, there, there have been some attempts, yeah. Uh, I'm, um, I'm not that up to date on uh, the most recent things mm -hmm. because I have not seen them. But uh, uh, I'm, uh, th there would be something that um, uh, would be definitely uh, worth exploring. First, I think in animals, it's not a simple thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that uh, the, uh, the spinal cord, things are very much intermingled. Uh, and so to stimulate the, uh, uh, to, to stimulate, uh, you have to stimulate electrically with microelectrodes implanted and so on. It, it gets to be quite complicated. So isolating individual modules to be able to stimulate them would be. It's the possible. Hard. It's possible, but um, but uh, you know it's very difficult then to 
avoid the spread of kind of to other modules and so on. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. So, yeah. so this next question is an interesting mm -hmm. one and it, it triggers in my head um, uh, a presentation that I saw only last week mm -hmm. out of a lab in the media lab. It's, uh, Elisa in New York is asking, what is the state of research on motor neuroprostheses? And uh, the presentation I saw was one about um, bionics, which I guess is kind of yes. neuroprostheses. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's an interesting, <coughs> very interesting question because I have a very strong opinion about that. Uh, now, there uh, has been a number of uh, attempts, uh, in first with animals and then with humans, of implanting set of electrodes in the motor cortex, extracting the signals, whatever, that uh, the, the paralyzed person thinks about uh, moving an arm, gets, uh, when you think about moving, you get signals uh, that uh, are similar to the one that uh, you use when for moving. So, uh, the uh, electrodes are, are picked up uh, and uh, the signals are picked up they are transformed and so forth and so on, and then they can activate either a cursor at the beginning, an XY cursor, uh, which could be useful to a person, uh, or uh, a robotic arm. That's it. That, um, now, the reason why I'm uh, not tremendously sympathetic to this effort is for the following reason. Uh, to implant things into the brain, is uh, an ordeal. The brain reacts to whatever implant tries to reject it. Uh, uh, in any case, there is a cellular reaction to it. And uh, the electrodes, after a while, just don't work anymore, don't pick up any signals, because they're surrounded by cells like scar cells. Okay. So, I think that to do, you know, and of course one can say, yeah, okay, you can open up the brain, the skull, and take it away and put another one there. Well, okay, uh, do you want to do that? Okay, but there are people that um, uh, have um, developed uh, the source of input to a prosthesis from the muscles, and if you can. And you can learn how to make many, uh, many activation of uh, parts of the muscle, usually it's pectoralis, and then use those signals to do uh, the movement of the prosthesis. And that seems to me the main road to do this type of things. Because it's, you, you know that you can, uh, naturally you have to have a little bit of, uh, of brain, but you, you know, even if the, the lesion is very high in the spinal cord, you can use the tongue, you can use the, the facial muscles, oh. okay? And think how many things you can do, if you look at Trump's face, how many <laughs> things <laughs> he can do with his face. <laughs> Anybody can do this kind of thing. So you can get plenty of signals by uh, activating your muscles and then, of course, then it's, then it's straightforward. So this is why uh, there was, about six months ago, an article in Nature, which we wrote a letter to Nature uh, disagreeing for the publication, because the publication gave uh, uh, credit to this uh, person that did uh, this experiment. This, uh, uh, and it's interesting because this was a young person that uh, had an accident, a swimming accident, you know, and uh, it was paralyzed. And uh, it's true, they put a set of electrodes in, uh, recording electrodes in his brain. Fine, they recorded impulses and uh, there was an ability to move the, the hand and the prosthesis. But the poor su subject, when he went home, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Because you know, to do that, he had to go to a laboratory which was, you know, connected and with all the machinery and so forth. To, so the father of this boy said, "What? What's? Wh why? Why have done this?" So the fact that the, they, uh, in nature, they uh, there was no mention that a most 
simple and straightforward and safer way to do that that irritated me considerably and as uh, and my colleagues too mm -hmm. so we wrote a letter which was never published <laughs> yeah. oh well um, Sergio in Vienna Austria uh -huh. Uh, asks, is it possible to enhance the ability of the brain by ingesting a specific set of nutrients, not drugs? Uh, let me think about it. Uh, you mean to, to get a better performance? Um, That's what he is asking. I, I think, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. Not that I know. I mean, uh, uh, the normal nutrition, of course, contains all sorts of uh, ions and uh, vita vitamins and so forth and so on, and that's, that's, that's plenty. Maybe, maybe yeah. what he's asking is, are there any specific foods or nutrients that are you know, sort of more powerfully important to the brain? You know, maybe something is important to muscle development, something else is important to brain development. Not that I know. Okay. Yeah. Daniel in Los Angeles asks, can you describe the brain's recovery process following ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes? Yeah, so I'm very much interested in, uh, uh, in stroke. In fact, I have um, a connections with a couple of hospitals in Italy where they uh, use um, methods that we have developed for the recovery. And uh, I'm very much interested in trying to apply uh, and to utilize the techniques of modularity in order to uh, improve the current way of uh, uh, recovery. And the reason is that um, uh, we have done uh, two studies, and we are continuing to do that, to uh, record uh, the modules in people that had a stroke. And particularly, usually a stroke is unilateral because it's one part of the brain. Is it? And so by recording this the modules, the synergies from the intact arm versus the affected arm, you can say, well, you know, what, is, what is it that uh, should be attempted to put this affected arm to in, in a situation similar to the uh, 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 good arm? And, um, and so uh, this has not yet, I mean, has not yet been, it's in the process of being developed. And I'm, uh, um, I'm confident that uh, uh, one could um, uh, use uh, the information derived from the synergies in order to somehow stimulate those muscles that are particularly affected and uh, then somehow uh, do the standard uh, rehabilitation procedures, which essentially is to try to generate uh, movements and that combined with stimulation of the muscle should be better, mm -hmm. but remains to be seen. Yeah, but it, it is an interest, it's, it's a very interesting area, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Cara in Vancouver asks, there have been other there have been other Bernstein-derived approaches to modularization in the motor control literature, e.g. Turvey. Where do you situate your views relative to those of others in the field? Yeah. See, yeah, the, the question of uh, modularity has been in the physiological literature for a long time. Uh, uh, Sherrington, one of the fathers of uh, modern neuroelectrophysiology, a century ago, more than a century ago, uh, said uh, he considered the reflexes that he described uh, like little modules. And essentially he said uh, movement must be a compounding of reflexes. Well, that's a very narrow view, of course, because it's, we are much more than reflexes. But in any case, it shows that uh, there is uh, that, that idea of uh, modularity is, uh, has been around for a lot, but the content of the idea is very different. Okay. And so, um, so this is, uh, and, then, and, then, and then throughout the history there have been a number of people that uh, talked about modularity uh, under different conditions. 
uh, like for instance, uh, my uh, colleague Neville Hogan here, mechanical engineering, he talks about modularity because he sees, particularly in patients uh, recovering from stroke, that uh, the movements are fragmented in uh, little chunks. And those chunks could be considered uh, modules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the question is to uh, define them, make sure that uh, you uh, that you describe uh, very precisely what you're talking about. Thank you. So um, Tomas in New Haven, Connecticut says, seemingly new and unexplained conditions affecting children's and adults' motor skills alike have made headlines in recent years. Do you think we're just better at detecting these conditions and that they have, or, and that they've been around for centuries, or are they indeed new? Uh, no, he doesn't say what are these conditions. No, yeah. and I'm, I'm not That's, sure I know. Uh, I would imagine that he's referring to um, those um, children that have uh, motor disorders, which are usually called motor uh, cerebral palsy. If it is that uh, that uh, uh, has not yet been explored from the point of view of uh, of the type of modularity that I'm talking about, mm. and uh, uh, th that is a quite a frustrating uh, field. Lots of uh, attempts have been done, um, particularly by surgeons, to um, modify the tendons, insertions, and so on, try to uh, gain some better function. But it's, it's, it's an awful, awful, compl awful complicated uh, thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I what we don't know about the brain is so much more than what we do know about the absolutely, brain. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so another question from Vancouver. Brian in Vancouver, British Columbia asks, you often discuss spinal modules. Are non-spinally mediated movements, such as those of the face or oral tract, controlled in the same way? And what is the role of the peripheral nervous system and biomechan biomechanics? Yeah. Uh, that uh, <coughs> so uh, th there is um, um, in uh, higher vertebrates, monkeys and humans, they, uh, there is a portion of the motor cortex that projects directly to the motor neurons. How that part of uh, uh, works in conjunction with uh, the part that is gone through the interneurons and the, and the modules is not yet known, but it is a very important question. And uh, uh, I, when I say what I've said about uh, you know movement being constructed by combination of modules and so. On, is, are there other ways for the central nervous system to move? Absolutely, yes. Mo I haven't, I, I don't have ex experimental evidence, but it's obvious that if I move a finger this way, there's no, no, no synergy. There's just a, a couple of muscles that, so obviously there, 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 there is uh, uh, a way to, um, uh, to uh, produce, although I have no, uh, no direct evidence of that, I'm, I'm quite sure that there are ways for the central nervous system to s bypass the spinal cord, interneurons, and so on. Okay, now the other thing about the biomechanics, this is, uh, uh, there are people uh, that, uh, uh, and some are, are my friends, and some are people <laughs> that were in my laboratory, that uh, give a lot of emphasis on um, the biomechanics. And, uh, <coughs> and they are right and wrong, in a sense that <laughs> it is absolutely true that in, as a system, motor system develops, has the muscles have to take into consideration the biomechanics, it's obvious. And so the 
in the shaping of, uh, because uh, prob probably the mass uh, motor, uh, syn motor synergies are, you know, something that it's developed as the baby starts to, <coughs> to move. So obviously uh, the biomechanics has an influence on shaping the, uh, to my mind that's obvious. Uh, now about the sensory, uh, the, the, the investigations, the most recent investigations show that the interneurons that I talked about that somehow generate the synergy, they receive descending and same, same cell and peripheral uh, sensory input. So ob it's quite obvious that uh, there is a lot, and we have done also experiment in it, there is a lot of tuning of the synergy that comes from uh, the sensory system. So it's... it's that makes it's it all the harder to really, really understand deeply. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, you know, the, in, the, uh, in the nervous system, the expression ultimately, what's in a simple behavior, is a result of a very complicated balance of things that come together, mm. fortunately, happily. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's never one thing, uh, you know, excluding everything else. No, it's, it's always, it, 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 movement is an emergent property that makes use of this or that, but makes use of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. That is sensory input, motor, biomechanics, and, uh, and so forth. So, yeah. and you're just studying the one part of it. Yeah, but you have to take into consideration that ultimately when you talk about the actual movement is a result of lots of things. Right. Yeah. Of course, there is something that's more important and something that's less important in certain circumstances. In other circumstances, the sensory system can you know, prevail. And so. So Liz in Philadelphia asks, are you hopeful that advances in deep brain stimulation will advance research on conditions like dystonia? Yeah, <coughs> well, um, these things are worth exploring, deep uh, stimulation. Uh, there was one case uh, very successful and that the deep stimulation of uh, a nucleus of the ganglia is called the uh, subthalamic nucleus. The stimulation of that nucleus makes uh, a Parkinsonian patient almost paralyzed, almost uh, without movement, makes him go around and dancing. I have seen friends that uh, were reduced practically, uh, couldn't get out of their house anymore, and so on and so on once they got these electrodes implanted. And it's a little bit of luck where exactly they have to be placed by very, uh, people that are very experts in controls and so forth. But once they're placed in the right uh, place, uh, and then for 10 or 20 years, wow. they're they are working. After a while, no. This is why they are not implanted in very old people because it's uh, too dangerous to do it. They're implanted in uh, relatively young Parkinsonians. But uh, there is, they tr you try to wait until, because they don't last, they last a considerable amount of time, but not. Uh, yeah, you want to wait as long as yes, you can so yes, that you get yeah, the maximum yeah, exactly. It's like uh, you functionality. Know, pros prosthesis in the, <laughs> in the knee and uh, in the hip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm afraid we are out of time. So on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, thank you, Emilio for continuing to inspire with your research and thank you for your enthusiasm in sharing it. Uh, so for our viewers, I want to thank you also for uh, joining us today. Um, we got to many of your questions, but maybe not all of them. If we did not get to your question, we will pass it on to Professor Bitsi after the webcast and you can share other questions or comments on Twitter using hashtag MIT Better World. You can also view an archive of past faculty forums online by visiting the Learn section on the Alumni Association website. Thank you all for joining us.